My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 214 of Legally Clueless. If you're an OG member, thank you for being part of the family. I really appreciate you and I'm so glad that you're here. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome to the family. Audio episodes like this go out every single Monday and you can stream them on Spotify and everywhere else you get podcasts on. Another thing you need to check out is our website, which is legallycluelessafrica.com. There you can watch our tour series, so watch us weave through Dubai, Zimbabwe, Paris, Kenya, recording amazing African stories. We also have three seasons of our video series out there, which I think you're definitely going to enjoy. There's some fantastic Africans just sharing such insightful, sometimes funny, <laughs> sometimes very inspiring stories. And lastly, if you want to share your story on this podcast, you want to be on an episode, why not? Check out the show notes. There is a link to a storyteller form. Fill it out and we will get back to you. As long as you're African, it doesn't matter where you are in this world. We want to hear your story and we want to share it with our family. So sign up on our storyteller form and we'll get back to you. We also do recordings virtually. So literally when I say wherever you are in the world, I kind of sort of mean that. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay. Last thing you also need to know is we are on Instagram at Legally Clueless Africa. That is our nice warm corner of the internet with no outrage, no anger. It's just good vibes. And if you want to share about the podcast on Twitter, just use a hashtag legally clueless so I can stalk you a bit easier. Yeah. (laughs) Now, in this episode, I finally have my therapist on here. This is something I've always wanted to do. Listen to this. Sometimes relationships redeem us just like Job and we'll talk about that. Remember in childhood, you'll amount to nothing, you're a failure. Then you get into this relationship, you think it redeems you from your failure. So what do you do? You hold it so tightly as a badge of honor and protect it to the core because you don't want to lose it because it has given you a life. You are without, without that marriage then in this relationship someone start changing you to who you are not so you start conforming to what this other party is saying by the way i don't like for example i don't like women who question i don't like men who go out so you conform to what this other party wants but it's not you so by the end of the day you kill what this person saw when you lose that now the inadequacies and uh, the fear of who you thought you were in childhood comes up. And what do you start doing? You start over-functioning. That you're doing 90% of work in that relationship. So that's Faith, and she is going to be on a little later in this episode. However, I do hope you are doing good before we actually get into good things. (laughs) Let's quickly check out the song of the week, which this week is oh my goodness one of my favorite songs if i could describe any time i have fallen in love with somebody in a song or as a song it would be this i feel like this song truly captures what i think true love has always felt like to me and it's a classic by jill scott the name of the song is he loves me ah I love it so much. I had forgotten about it and then it popped up on my playlist when I was listening to it on Shuffle and it just took me back to I remember listening to it I think in freshman year if I'm not wrong and uh, I love it so much. So if you never listened to it here's your chance to if you have and have forgotten it here's a great reminder. I put a link to the song in the show notes. So before we get to my random convo with Faith I'm currently working on the hyper independence episode I want to shout out everybody who sent messages on Instagram saying that that's an episode they'll be interested in receiving. So I am working on it. But in the process of that, I realized that something I'm battling that I thought wasn't related to hyper-independence is related to it. And I found this out in my last therapy session this past week. Right now with my partner, I struggle to allow him to show me kindness and I think it's across the board even like in friendships or other relationships a part of me feels like allowing anyone to be kind or help me etc translates to me being a burden to them you know 
And at first glance, you're probably thinking like, how is this related to hyperindependence, blah, blah, blah. Well, it does result in it. But in therapy, we finally cracked where this began. And I, I was having such a hard time because I was like, this is not a result of my relationship with my mom, not a result of my relationship with my dad. But we realized that there was a stage in my life where when I was younger, I received very conditional help from a family member. And I subconsciously carried that with me all these years where if you're helping me, I automatically think that this is conditional. I'm going to be made to feel like a burden. The power dynamics are definitely shifting. I don't just think of it as somebody's being kind to me you know what I mean and when in therapy we unlocked how where I had picked this up it all started to make sense and so then how it results in hyper independence is because I don't want your kindness or your help or whatever I now become hyper 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 independent even in moments where I'm breaking I'm just like "Mm -mm, not gonna ask for help (laughs) but I am making progress first and foremost just acknowledging the problem starting to work on it, now knowing where it stemmed from. That's a plus in my book and I'm like clapping for myself for that. But I've also began accepting the kindness and the help and the random acts of love. And it feels really good. I'm just like, wow, okay. (laughs) I want more of this. (laughs) And you know, when I unlock how things I experienced in childhood and teenagehood affected me, To date, I mean, I'm 34 years old now. Like, (laughs) this is a long time. But when I unlock how these things from back then affect me now or have given me extra baggage (laughs) in my adulthood, it really just reaffirms to me my belief that before you have kids, man, you really have to be knee deep in your healing journey and be very self-aware. And you've just got to be very careful as well who has access to your child. Yep, even family. And so I, I mean, it doesn't scare me from having kids. I know I went through the phase where I knew for sure I wanted one child. And then that changed to, I don't want any kids. And then I was like, you know what, I'm open. If it happens, it happens. And so it's not coming from a place of fear of this is why I'll never have kids it's coming from a place of you've got to be intentional about not just when you have kids and the things that need to be in order but you you need to be in order you and your partner or partners need to be in order you know what I mean anyway this episode is not about children (laughs) I have Wanted to have my therapist on here for Ian's. I feel like whenever I come here and talk about her, I'm backbiting her. <laughs> so I know that this hour here, so it doesn't sound like I'm gossiping about her when I talk to you about our therapy sessions. And I'm happy that it's finally happening. So her name is Faith and she facilitates the Legally Clueless group therapy sessions. We have our next one, which is coming up on the 29th of April at 9.30 a.m. at Kanga Studio here in Nairobi. Tickets of 1,500 shillings, and we've almost sold half of the tickets already. So you need to grab your ticket ASAP. They are available on LegallyCluelessAfrica.com or just check out the show notes. I've put a link there. So the theme is losses without funerals. So I figured that I should invite Faith to have a random convo with me to tell us more about the theme. So that's what we did. First and foremost, it's always been in my plans to have you on Legally Clueless, in case you didn't know. I think from when we started working together and I was doing my therapy sessions with you, I would talk about you a lot on the podcast <laughs> and share about, I think I did a whole episode on boundaries from the boundary work that we did. I did a whole episode on loss from the loss work that we did. So Faith, it's such an honor to finally have you here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adele, for having me. Uh, it's nice working with you. Um, humbled. And so in the lead up to our next group therapy session, I thought this is the best time to have you on to really unpack our theme, which is losses without funerals. But before we even get to that, for people to get to know you a bit better, because I'm just like, I talk about you like you're my best friend. <laughs> just like Faith said, no, no, no. But... Maybe you could share, and I've never known this, why you decided to go into psychology and the work that you do. Was that something you always wanted to do or 
did life happen and you just found this passion? Mm -hmm. uh, what I did, I, la I was working in the bank and at some point I started dragging my feet and uh, I could encourage people to move to the next level of their, of their career, but I felt stuck. And I, th I think I remember me saying, I think I'm tired of escorting people to their destiny and I'm stuck. So I left banking. Uh, it, it reached a point where I, was, I think I was stuck. I felt stuck. So I left banking. And uh, like any other Kenyan, I went into business. Before even I left the bank, for about a month, I was doing business. I love color. So I was doing shoes. I was doing handbags. Mm. Then uh, I saw some money in my account that I had not seen. <laughs> oh, yes. I hit it. So I resigned. Uh, earlier on, I was telling my husband, by the way, I need to leave the bank. But this time, uh, I told him, by the way, this time around, I am not informing you. I am giving you a statement that I'll leave the bank in August. Mm. And I did. And I hit the road running. Uh, being uh, who I am, my personality, I did so many things. I did, uh, I did procurement. I did uh, farming. <laughs> I did rabbit farming. I did. I almost sold land. But I remember uh, when I was selling shoes, one of my mentors came to my shop, and I think at the shop where I was selling shoes and handbags, he noticed that I anyone who would come to my shop, they would buy not give me the money, then I would talk to them for about 30 minutes. Mm. And he told me, do you know what, Faith, you're not a good person. You are a service person. Then as if that was not enough, uh, my son came t to the shop and told me, Faith, do you know what? I have never seen you in this. I've always seen you in an office as a counseling psychologist. And I'm telling you because your name is Faith, pray to that God for three days. So for three days, I didn't sell. But for three days, three people came to my shop. One said I had encouraged her, I had uh, inspired her, I had talked to her, and she had gotten a, a promotion in Nakuru as a service delivery manager in the bank. So the other one came and told me, the same day, the other one came and told me, were it not for you, my mom would have killed herself. So the third one came, say, anytime you send these messages, I really get encouraged. And I was like, huh? What is this? Now, leaving the bank, sometimes you can have the money, not a lot, but you want to, you don't sit down and reconcile with yourself. What is it you're good at? My, what I am good at came when I got broke and realized rabbit farming wasn't for me. Farming wasn't for me. Any other business is in terms of good wasn't for me, but service was. Was this a running theme? Sorry, I'm now just so intrigued. Was this a running theme throughout your life that probably even... The first time you studied counseling, the next time you went back to school, were people around you for years kind of saying or coming to you to talk? Oh, yes, yes. Mm. In fact, when I did counseling, everyone was like, yeah, that's my, that's your career. But no one ever told me in the banking industry, that is your career. The people who knew me when I was a child, when I was a teenager, I was a, a young adult. And now, of course, uh, late years in my, in my life, uh, they're like, yeah. No, at least you've gotten what you, we have always thought. Mm. So it's very sad that everyone knew uh, I, was, I would do counseling very well, yet I didn't. Mm. So I was pushed to counseling because of uh, not making it, you know, starting very many businesses and failing. So I really needed to know my niche. So you can always say like getting broke and, and the yeah. businesses failing were like a silver lining, you know? And you don't sit down to realize that you're failing because you have about three things that you're working. Now, because of my personality, I don't even sit down to realize that I'm losing money until the time I don't have anything in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and here, this procurement that is not paying, it's paying very well. Then all of a sudden, it's not paying. Now, the other thing with business, because I'm not, I don't think I'm a good person. Those people who, who are good people, they are able to tell this client will not come back. So I get into this business and I'm selling shoes. I'm selling handbags. I was doing very well. Then in the middle of the thing, a client asked, by the way, do you have a sweater? By the way, do you have socks? Mm. By the way, so my shop became a kikuyu shop. <laughs> Anything and everything. <laughs> it's only charcoal that I did. <laughs> and uh, now what I didn't know is this person who has asked for this thing will not come back. So by the time I close that shop, I think to date I put on something. <laughs> From the shop, from store. Shop. Yeah. So I have shoes that are 42, uh, 42, 42 size. I put 41. There's no one to sell it to. So I have to put on some things and wear it for some years. 
just because I didn't want to bear the loss. So because it was not my area, so I didn't know how to go about it. So mm. this shop that was only selling shoes and was only selling handbags became a very clumsy. It, it had everything. Yeah. And and nothing at the same time. <laughs> nothing. I was good at I was selling everything but not good at anything. Then the other thing that I realized when I was when I opened that shop, I had not sat down and realized my eighty percent clients were online. I had opened the shop for the twenty percent. So of course meaning that I wasn't doing well. I would still have survived without opening a shop. I realized I am not more of service and not in goods. And it's it's interesting to hear that journey because I feel like the work that we've done, you helped me realize that journey. <laughs> I realized that for myself as well. I remember when I, w- I came onto the podcast after we did specifically work around loss. And I remember saying for the longest time, I thought when you asked me, write down the losses you've experienced in your life. I only wrote down my mom, like losing my mom. And I come the next session and you're like, okay, like there are more losses, there are more losses. And I'm like, I'm telling you, there's only this one and this one. And I think it was two sessions in that then the the page that I had got full of so many losses. And I was just like, oh my God, yeah, that's a loss. This other thing's a loss. So how did you kind of come to the theme of losses without funerals? And, and what does it really mean? Because the first time that I experienced it was with you and it has been some of the most impactful self-work I've done. Thank you, Adele. I coined that word from my own experience. And I think uh, that this was during COVID time, but it doesn't mean I lost my things in, during COVID time. So after, after the bank, of course, businesses went down. So we went under, under financially everything. So even if it means, uh, it, it meant that time borrowing money, I would only buy borrow money pegged on my children. I had nothing. So when I lost everything, I would go and tell someone, imagine I am, I'm this, I'm this, I don't have food, I don't have this. And no one would really take it because I didn't look sad. So they're like, are you sharing your story or are you sharing someone else's story? And I remember at some point things were so bad and uh, we went to church one time with uh, our daughter and I think there were contributions, contributions towards someone I think who had lost a loved one. And she was like, mom, I think these people need to contribute to us. We've lost everything. And I was like, ah, which was true. Mm -hmm. We had lost everything. But now how I came up with losses without funerals, even when I started doing counseling, it's realizing people would come. It's true they have lost their loved ones. But that loss, physical loss of a loved one, would provoke or trigger other losses they are not dealt with. Just look around when you go for a funeral. There are those ones who really cry, but you're not related, don't even know them very well. So this person who has died, you are crying because you have things that have died in your life, but you don't know how to process them. So they remind you of certain death in your life. This is, would be loss of a job, loss of maybe a, a mom, loss of even of a child through miscarriage, loss of properties, loss of yourself in a marriage. You know, we lose ourselves in relationships, loss of opportunities, loss of uh, education, because maybe you had targeted you'd get to this place and you didn't. So this now become the place. You're not mourning or you're not crying because the person who has died. It is the only space to let out your pain and everyone will understand mm-hmm. and you're crying because of this, but it's not true. Even as we mo- we cry at the funeral, we cry for all different reasons. Even if you are crying because of the person who has died. Sometimes you cry because of guilt. I, I didn't visit him in hospital. I didn't do one, two, three. I wasn't there because of guilt, because of regret, because of uh, things maybe I would have done and I didn't do. And also maybe guilt, you've gone to uh, a friend's mom's funeral and you're like, gosh, I didn't visit her in hospital. Then we become very selfish. We're like, I wish she stayed on for me to visit so that that guilt is not there. I remember you in our last group therapy session, you brought up this point and I really identified with it because I cry at funerals like not a professional moon now, but like really, it's a deep, there's a lot of crying that happens. And initially I thought it was triggering. It take me back to like my mom's funeral, which yes, that plays a part. But I also found out that like my, my need to help the person, because most of the funerals I've been to since have been maybe a friend's mom or friend's person. And I'm crying because I feel helpless because I know what they're about to experience. 
And then I don't know, there's nothing I can do. And then I don't want to be pessimistic when you ask me for, for help, but I want to tell you, hey, <laughs> this is hell. But I realized that my tears were not coming. Obviously, yes, I'm. it's sad the person has died, but like my tears were coming from elsewhere. Exactly. Just like a wedding. You can uh, attend a, wed a wedding, and this is for a young couple, and you have been in a marriage that you have lost, or you have lost yourself in a marriage. So instead of celebrating this a young uh, dude who are marrying or getting married, you start crying because of the experiences you've gone through in your own marriage. And you imagine, gosh, they are getting themselves into this deep pit mm -hmm. and have been unable to come out. I just feel like that was the last work that we did. It was such a great foundation because then now when we got to boundary work, I kind of understood where to place certain both people and experiences that I had experienced in my life, like where in the circle of people who are influencing me, those things would go. There's another term that came up both in our therapy sessions mm -hmm. and also the last group therapy session, which was essential self. And I found it so interesting in our one-on-one -on -one therapy mm -hmm. when we came towards the end of mm -hmm. digging through the trenches. And now at least I wasn't crying in every, <laughs> every session where when we talked about the things I liked when I was in class seven and in class six, it was fascinating that those are things that I gravitate towards naturally even now, as much as for over decades, maybe two decades or whatever, I was moved away from them. So the term essential self is something I find to be so powerful. But what exactly is our essential self? Essential self is uh, who you are before you are corrupted, meaning you had what you are meant to become within you. Mm -hmm. But now when we are born and uh, now depending on the family dynamics, one, you conform to social self. Essential self is who you are before you do an exam, uh, before you are compared to, before someone, someone tells you you're not good enough. That bubbly girl, that bubbly boy that you are, that is the essential self. Now come class eight, come class seven, or depending on uh, whatever uh, exam you did, then someone tells you you are good at this or you're not good at this. So you conform to what your primary caregiver are telling you you are or the people around you. Mm. So you're not bright enough, you're not good enough, you're not this. The other thing where your essential self is your jolly, and for example, maybe you have a parent who is uh, looking after a sick child. This, this is just an example. You have a firstborn, you are a firstborn, and you have your, your sibling, uh, the secondborn, who has maybe a condition. So the parent is very busy taking care of this child. She's not happy or he's not happy. So the firstborn is looking at a way, how do I make my mom happy? Because my general happiness, like even bubbly, she'll start saying, uh, can you just play outside? What are you doing? Because she's sad. So she, uh, she directs that sadness to you. So what you start doing as a child, young child, you start looking at how can I become a good child to my mom? So you start seeing this child bringing in, helping in uh, taking care of this child who is a special child by bringing in diapers. Mommy, can I bring diapers? Mommy, can I do this for me? Mommy, are you happy? That child is losing himself into conformity to what the mother wants or would love the child to become. Mm -hmm. So the essential self is who you are naturally. And if you want to know as you age, because like now what I do, I am in my essential self. In the bank, I was a social self in procurement, in businesses, rabbit farming, banana farming, with the sweet potato farming, with the malenge farming. You did it all. <laughs> I did it all. And it was, you use a lot of force. If you want to know if you're operating in your essential self or social self, in essential self, there's no struggle. In social self, like now when I was selling the handbags, I could really talk to these guys. And I would ask them, can't they remove the money from their bag? So they are saying, were it not for you talking to us this good, they wouldn't have bought. Yet the bag had quality. So it's operating from the, the social self, which is the dynamic are different. So they are, they are a bit of struggle, mm -hmm. but with the essential self, it's seamless. That's powerful because it, it speaks to childhood. On the podcast, I have spoken about growing up in, in a very violent home. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could unpack the profiles mm -hmm. that come up with that. So you're in this space as a child mm -hmm. and you start losing your essential self because of it and you assume a character or a profile mm -hmm. right and when you broke the three profiles down i could i was just like yep that's what is me <laughs> so maybe you could share what those 
three. Are they called profiles or what are they? They are called dysfunctional rules. Rules, okay. Family. So we, we all grew up in a family. Each family has its own dynamic. We say almost every family is dysfunctional, but it all depends with the magnitude of the dysfunctionality. And I'll give an example. If you have a parent who is, uh, for example, drinking, a child or even the other parent will assume their role. So we have a functioning addict and we have an addict. A functioning addict will go to work and provide, but they will not be there for their family because most of their time they will spend either drinking or doing other things. And it's not only drinking. There's something I've done on my YouTube channel called Family in a Bottle. It is not only drinking. So there's a bottle of anger, a bottle of infidelity, a bottle of, uh, yeah, there are very many bottles, which maybe we can do that later. So when this happens, we have now the identified patient as the dad, for example. This is just an example. Now we have what we call the enabler. The enabler is a person who now says, you know, even if he falls on the ditch, we need to pick him up with that embarrassment or you give him money to go and drink. This could also be a son. This could also be a daughter. Uh, you give him money to go and drink because you don't want him to cause tantrums and all that. So you become the enabler. The enabler, whatever this person is not doing, you start doing, for example, for providing and being there for the family. Now, in the family, now the children take up other roles. For example, maybe my, my dad or someone's dad, you're drinking and you're passing through your primary school. So you are, your friends are seeing and they are mimicking or even uh, talking about it, so you're embarrassed. So what you do, a hero is a pick up that role to save the family from the shame. Like, yes, I was brought up by this person, but uh, can you see I've become? So what we call now the golden child. We have now the, the scapegoat. The scapegoat or the rebellious child is the one who looks like the identified patient. They are drinking just like their father. The father will start blaming them for the failures. Were it not for this child, this home would be okay. Now, this person, the scapegoat, it is a true manifestation of what is going on in that home. But what do we do? We point a finger at them. The others were able to cope. The others may not be able to cope. We have what we call the lost child. This lost child will detach from the family, will not be seen, will not be heard because uh, of the trauma that is going on or the dysfunctionality that is going on in the, uh, within the family. So they'll be lost in books. They'll be lost in, uh, in other things. They'll be lost in not talking. In, they'll be lost in not sharing. Then when we have what we call the mascot or the clown who will make fun around home, like now maybe there's a fight, they will bring in a, a joke so that the family can laugh, can uh, even forget whatever they are going through. Now the challenge becomes, comes when you're not able to live, to even identify that you're carrying up, that you're taking up these roles. So you become a hero, you become a rebellious child, you become a mascot even earlier on in the, in the years. What you do, you pick up a rule, then you, you pick up your social self and leave your essential self because you cannot play both. Or even surrogacy. Uh, this is when a parent maybe has died. So a child pick up the role of the father or the mother who has died and say, I'll be providing. So you're already wearing on the other person's responsibility and leaving now yourself. And I found that to be so powerful because like these, it showed the method to the madness almost. For me, I started to understand like I adopted a rule and then I became so good at it that I thought this is who I am until you start feeling uncomfortable and you're like, but why? Like I've been doing this forever. You mentioned earlier intimate relationships and how one can lose themselves in, in relationships, maybe intimate or not, because I think you can also lose yourself in friendships, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe you can unpack that because those are, in my experience, those are, it's harder to even identify that you're losing yourself because of socialization, especially as women. When you give of yourself in a marriage or whatever, you are the model wife, you know, but you're losing your identity and yourself, you know. In fact, what I say, we get into a relationship because either we are, uh, we are attracted to each other, there's potential. In fact, relationships into a marriage, relationship for a longer relationship, because there's something about this person that I like and envy. Now, when we get into this relationship, many things happen, but I'll mention a few. We like each other because we're individuals. We love each other because we are different. Then because of that difference, we get married or in a relationship. Then in this relationship, someone starts changing you to who you are not. So you start conforming to what this other party is saying. By the way, I don't like, for example, men who drink. I don't like women who shout. 
then you stop. I don't like women who question. I don't like men who go out. So you conform to what this other party wants, but it's not you. So by the end of the day, you kill what this person saw. When you lose that, now the inadequacies and uh, the fear of who you thought you were in childhood comes up. And what do you start doing? You start over-functioning. That you're doing 90% of work in that relationship. You can also lose yourself in enmeshment, depending on your personality. Uh, enmeshment is where you start asking for permission. You start thinking about what, what will happen if I do this. But the other party is individuated, meaning he or she will do her thing, come back, find someone who is very annoyed. And I'll give an example where you're okay being in the house as the two of you, and you're not even talking to each other. Up until the outgoing person decides to shower and leave. Then you start getting grumpy uh, because you have nothing. You lost your friends. You got into a relationship, lost your friends, lost what you, you are doing. In fact, what lost what this person admired you doing. By the time you realize, oh my God, who, who am I in this relationship? Enmeshment. Now, the other thing, sometimes relationships redeem us just like Job and we'll talk about that. Remember in childhood you'll amount to nothing, you're a failure. Then you get into this relationship, you think it redeems you from your failure. So what do you do? You hold it so tightly as a badge of honor and protect it to the core because you don't want to lose it because it has given you a life. You are without without that marriage. That's such, like, I'd even forgotten that point, yeah, how you hang on even when it's painful because it's redeeming you. You did mention about the same can happen in friendships, isn't it? Yes, it can. It can happen in, uh, in friendship where uh, during the first stages, the relationship is authentic, the relationship is congruent, it is genuine. But now remember the two of you are growing or transitioning differently. So the changes happen where either one of you is growing, one of you is having other friends and realizes this relationship is not fulfilling me. There's nothing. You know where you meet and you go back home and evaluate, by the way, what did Adele tell us? <laughs> yeah. We spent three hours and all we were doing was gossiping. It all depends with how you form this relationship. Was it pegged on pity party? Like, please, let's come. Uh, let's talk about our husbands. Let's talk about our boyfriends. Let's talk about our girlfriends. So one of you does the self-work and realizes this now relationship does not benefit her. When that happens, the other party, because they don't want to lose this relationship, they start, they are the ones who are calling, they are the ones who are organizing for uh, outings, they are the ones who are asking the other party how they are. In fact, you should always question, if you stopped doing what you're doing in a relationship, would there be a relationship? And you also need to know, in relationships, there's what we call the inner, the outer, the circles. Mm -hmm. You could be a friend. We are friends, yes, but you are not in my inner circle. I'm in your circle 40 and you're in my circle 1. So I'll be expecting different things from you. So if I am, you are in my number 1 circle, I mean circle number 1, I expect you to do everything that pertains to a good relationship. But now for you, I am in circle 46. By the way, this one will be meeting after a month and saying, hi, hello, to keep it going, but there's no intimacy. So we also need to be evaluating our relationships as we grow older because we are, we are not supposed to have permanent relationship or friendship. If you have a classmate, a primary school, a high school, a campus, and now you are as old as I am, and you need to evaluate this relationship. Do they build you? In fact, the issue is, do you give the strokes? You know, there's what we call the strokes and gibbs. Mm. Like, I do this to them. That makes me feel good. And you, you start of a functioning in a relationship. Because in this relationship, you are feeling so good that you are a friend to Adele, you are a friend to Faith, or you are a friend to someone else. Because you don't think without of a functioning, you could be a friend to anyone. So you go into relationship with gift packs. I know you don't like me, but here I am. I can be washing stuff for you. I can be doing this for you. I can be... Co you give yourself a role in this relationship because coming there, you don't think you'll be accepted. Yeah. That's, that's really powerful. Another place where loss happens, which is quite interesting, is in your job <laughs> or in your career or the line of work that you choose. Because... I think sometimes we forget that just the same way like kids get super influenced at school because of how many hours they are there versus at home. Even us, we spend so many hours at work and then even culturally having a job comes with like status or something, you know what I mean? 
And so it's funny that even that, I feel like that's even harder than relationships to identify when you've lost yourself because it comes with so much goodness. It even comes with money. So it's hard to identify when you have attached your identity. You're not being your essential self because these perks that come here, but you're uncomfortable. I'll take you back to where we we were told in childhood, you lament to nothing, you, love no, you have nothing, you're running away from poverty, uh, you are a loser, mm. all that. Then fortunately, you get a job. You work very hard to get to some space where you run away from these words. And that's why sometimes you see someone overachieving. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll go to a PhD, a PhD level, but still feel dissatisfied. Now, this job, Remember, this job has redeemed you because you are nothing without this job. And this is what is happening during COVID. No, and now the repercussions of COVID. If you lose your job, that's why there's mental illness so much because people lost what redeemed them from their failures. Now, because you don't want to lose this job, this job has given you a space in an industry or in the community where otherwise you wouldn't have had it. Mm -hmm. So people listen to you. You're able to provide. You're able to make decisions. You're able to call a kangaroo, you know, meeting. You are, you have followers. You have people who admire you. You have people you are uh, you're feeding. You have people who in the community you are helping. Then you lose this. So these things that you are doing because of this job, have they have given you a name. So you will do everything to ensure that you don't lose this that has given you a name. Mm -hmm. So I will overwork. For example, if I'm introverted, and this happens and, uh, subconsciously, if I'm introverted, then I'm taken to the marketing uh, space. People say, I am extroverted because you need to sell. But when now you lose that job, you realize, by the way, that job is the one that made me who I am. So we have two personas that this is who I am when I'm working, but behind the scene, or my true self, I'm introverted. Mm. So you can lose even your, you, you can lose yourself in that space. The other way, the other way you lose yourself is the competition. You know, work. So you wake up in the morning. You are not working. You're home, but your thoughts. You leave your thoughts at your place of work. So I'm, I go home, and on a math, I'm thinking, what did my boss do? What is it they are talking about? Would I get a sack? Would I get a promotion? So you are out of your space work, but the thoughts are all that pertains to work. So what do you do? You provide at the place you're meant to provide. May it be family, may it be uh, the extended family, but they will never see you because you cannot afford to be away from this thing that redeemed you. And I, I completely identify with that. Coming from media, you are compared to other personalities and you're different. You're compared to numbers. How many numbers are you bringing in? And I used to do that thing, although I regret at the end, but like I used to do the thing where I'd win all these awards of like most hardworking employee. Most of and at a point I asked myself, I am working hard, but I'm not working smart. <laughs> yeah. But what about business? Because I, I fear... I love what I do. I love my business and everything. And I don't even understand or see failure. Like I don't register it as failure. So if I pitch and I don't get an advertiser or a partner, I don't immediately, I don't feel bad. I'm just like, well, I guess that wasn't for, for, for us. Back to the drawing board, we have to make this work, right? But I fear about getting into the loop that I was with in employment because I created this business. So there's a way my identity can get enmeshed here. And it's good now. <laughs> and what could it go wrong also in business? Yes, it can. Your business can grow. And now depending on the brand that you're selling outside there, it could be maybe your business. So because your business is out there, sometimes you don't know how to relate with that fame. Remember you are behind the scene person, you you love being not seen. So you don't know how to, to identify with that. There are things in business, you can go into business, that this is happening to the young ones. You want the publicity, but you are an introverted person or very coiled. So you feel like I have to be influenced. I, I have to be under influence for me to perform. Mm. I have to be under, you know, I have to be a bit tipsy in order for me to perform. Yes, you can. The other thing is you can also lose uh, yourself in business by sometimes you can give yourself. There's no separate Adele and your business. Mm. But when I ask you, by the way, when was the last time you had a break? Then you have a what break? Yeah. You know, because you feel when you have a break, this thing will crash. Yeah. Crash, which is not the case. 
So yes, you can. You just have to be really vigilant about it. It's hard to know. The funny thing about loss as we come towards the end is like, you know something is wrong, but you don't know what is wrong. So it's like having a headache, which is like I drank water. I like, <laughs> can't really taste it. And I remember feeling discomfort and feeling exhausted and not physically like so tired. So what are some of the symptoms or the feelings that come with not acknowledging and navigating the losses you've experienced? Uh, moments, bounce of sadness, anger. And you're angry with yourself. You're mm-hmm. angry with people. Mm-hmm. To a point where you wonder, why are they laughing? What is there to laugh about? Sometimes you feel overwhelming sadness. You don't know where it's coming from, overwhelming sadness. Then you have a sense of hopelessness. A sense of hopelessness would come from, remember you have, you had a loss. And this could be in childhood. There are many losses in childhood. Then it catches up with you. You know, we say trauma sits in the body. Then what we say about loss, you can never heal from a loss you've not processed. So... Yes, you can. And this comes because of trigger. You get triggered and you feel like that person has taken me back to a place I didn't want to get, a dark place. Mm. And you feel there's no sense of ever advancing because uh, I am not good enough. You start doubting, doubting yourself. What comes now, Arthur? Maybe what I call the three psychological inheritances. I can unpack that later. What you call internalized shame, internalized guilt, internalized doubt and internalized hopelessness. These are worse than addiction. They sound heavy. (laughs) (laughs) They sound heavy. They're they're very heavy. Okay. And and so we have our next, and I'm so happy that we're doing this together. Um, So we have our next group therapy session coming up on the 29th of April. What can someone who attend expect from it, the theme being losses without funerals? Okay, insight. The first thing is insight. Mm. You're able to to at least confirm, I think this is the loss I'm dealing with, or this is where I lost myself. The other thing is self-awareness, ability to deal with the dysfunctionality in order for you to become functional. You know, when you don't deal with a loss or a trauma for that matter, you will be seeing life from your own losses. If someone was raped at seven years or defiled at seven years, then you have your baby at seven years. You start becoming hypervigilant to protect this child from what you went through. So this child becomes a reminder. So that's why I'm saying uh, working from dysfunctionality to functionality, uh, coming to terms with your own losses, finishing the unfinished businesses, because we all have unfinished businesses, (laughs) knowing what is your Pandora box. A Pandora box is that thing that We really want to protect ourselves from someone ever knowing. Mm -hmm. It's a dark space in our lives that we would want to delete from the world. You know, you'd have to open that Pandora box. Mm -hmm. And uh, realizing that this is a safe space, the losses without funerals, those are the primary losses. Now, we have now what we call the secondary losses. Because of that first loss, you have other secondary losses. Uh, allowing yourself to, at least you'll be able to know by the end of the session, the program, that what are my secondary losses? Because you might have healed from the primary loss, but you didn't do the work for the secondary losses. Mm. Yes. I think I identify with that. Because <laughs> like bulk of what I was trudging through were secondary losses that were spearheaded from the, from the main one. In closing, if do you have any inspiring words that you want to leave? the audience with before you meet them on the 29th. Yes. My motto, my Hetabel Counseling Services is have the courage to heal. Have the courage to heal. We are here to give you support. We are here to work with you. If this is a non-judging environment, so kindly see you then on 29th Saturday at Kanga Studios. I really enjoyed that convo. I lost so many parts of me in childhood and adopted not just a social self, but like a survival self. And then that's who I was for so long that I convinced myself that that's who I am. (laughs) And again, at my big age, but I'm not judging myself. I'm happy it's happened. But now is when I've 
returned to my essential self. And, you know, just having that conversation and even in our therapy session, I realized I definitely lost myself in my last relationship. I remember waking up one day and I just didn't recognize myself or the life around me. And I did have some of the symptoms she mentioned and just overall discomfort, really. Anyway, this and more is what we're going to dig into in our group therapy session on the 29th of April. If you can do come, it would be so great to meet you and then start this healing journey with you together. And I really think understanding your losses is step one in healing. It has been for me. It's like doing an audit of why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Something is wrong, but I'm not sure what. I don't feel like this is who I really am, but I don't know who I am. I just feel like this is such a great step one to healing from whatever specific experiences have influenced you or altered you. So check out the show notes. There's a link there that will take you to our website, legallycluelessafrica.com, where you can grab your tickets. And don't forget to share this with anyone who you think would be interested in a group therapy session like this. Why not? Let's spread the wellness opportunities, right? Also, do remember if you're in Kenya, you can catch this podcast on Trace FM. We're there every Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. and every Friday at 1 p.m. Just head over to traceradio.co.ke to stream Trace there. I am going to leave you with what's coming up in our next episode. It is a part two that we've been waiting for for a while. And then my laptop got jacked and then we didn't have that part two. And we were also sad about it. But the awesome lady that our storyteller is made time to link up with me for us to re record it. Yep, the second part of Sweetie's story is going to be out next week. So, this is what you can expect in next week's episode. When I got transferred to St. Clair's, I think they already told the school, you know, this is what the storm we are bringing. So, when I got into that school already, everybody knew my shenanigans. You know, the sister, Sister Steven was always telling me, you and women, I want you to stay apart. I was so traumatized. I hated myself. I was just like, why am I doing this to myself? Can't I just like control myself? And when I was moving to the second school, I told myself, I'm going to control myself. I knelt every night praying to God that please send me a boy. Please give me a boy. And when I went to this second school, I even made an imaginary boyfriend, like, just so that I can talk about boys when girls are talking, so that they know I like boys too. And the boyfriend that I invented was called Polycap. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.